Here's Greg Kukul to explain his warped view of reality and evidence. Of all of the questions that every human being asks about what's true, or about what's important, or about what's meaningful, there is no more significant question to answer than this one. Does God exist? You know, God's existence is the most decisive issue of life because the answer you give to that one question sets an irrevocable course for everything that follows. What do you mean by irrevocable? That makes it sound like you can't change your mind. Or like it makes no difference if you change your mind. If that were the case, why would there be born-again Christians? Now in this course, you will learn that we don't have to guess when it comes to answering the question about God's existence. Instead, God's fingerprints, so to speak, are all around us. In other words, the world around us, the real world, is thick with evidence for God. In fact, we bump into it all the time. Well, how exactly do you give evidence of a timeless, spaceless, disembodied mind? It seems to me that such a thing would be pretty unobservable. I don't know how you could directly witness such a thing, and I don't know what effect such a thing could have which could be observed. Most phenomena cited as evidence for God seem to be order or complexity in nature, as though those things are impossible or at least improbable without being shaped by a conscious mind. That doesn't follow at all, and even if it did, it couldn't be evidence of something being timeless and spaceless because it existence depends on time and space. You can't show evidence of a self-contradictory concept. So first, we need to define our terms here. Now, we know what theism is. It's a belief that there is a personal God, a conviction that God exists. So what's atheism? It's just the opposite. Atheism, now watch this, is the belief that there is no God. A King David wrote, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands, all right? The atheist, by contrast, says the cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. Again with the definition nonsense. Listen, there are multiple equally legitimate definitions of atheism. Some atheists define it as a denial of the existence of God, and some define it as a mere lack of a belief in God. They treat atheism as an umbrella term that includes agnosticism. Now before we go any further, I want you to notice something else about atheism. It is a standard move by atheists nowadays to simply say they are not asserting that God doesn't exist, but they simply have no belief in God. And since they lack a belief, they don't need to defend their lack of belief, all right? Now, I don't think that's exactly intellectually honest because no one writes best-selling books about their lack of beliefs, all right? Hitchens did. He was one of the atheists who defined atheism as a lack of belief, and he wrote several best-selling books about that lack of belief in God. Atheists are making a case, and the case that they're trying to make is that there is no God. I agree that the atheists who defend their atheism are making a case. I'm making a case. But I'm not making a case that there is no God. I'm making the case that the arguments and evidence presented do not lead to the conclusion that there is a God. If there is a God, nobody has shown me or told me anything that convinces me that there is one. That is the only case I am making. That's their belief. Certainly they have no belief in God. Agreed but they do have a belief about God. And their belief about God is that God doesn't exist. So it's not like they don't have to make a defense for their view since they're not really asserting anything. They are, they're asserting that God does not exist. And that is their belief about God that they are holding and advancing. Nope. I don't even understand what a God is. I don't understand what it means to say that a God does or does not exist. The reason that we believe in God is because he's the best explanation for the way things are. I don't understand how an incoherent concept can be an explanation at all, let alone the best explanation for anything. And what I was doing with her, even though I didn't explain it at the time, is I was introducing the notion of explanatory power. What I mean by that is, you see things in the world and you're simply asking the question, what best explains these significant features of the real world? And if you have an idea that explains them well and a contrary idea that doesn't, then the first idea has better explanatory power and therefore is more likely to be true. 
This doesn't fully unpack what a good explanation is. A good explanation is coherent, which God is not. It can be used to make testable predictions, which the idea of God does not. It has to make falsifiable predictions, which the idea of God does not. And it has to be simpler than other explanations, which God is not. Now, just a little hint here. I want to let you in on a strategic insight. For us as Christian theists, we have a powerful ally. And what is that? We have reality on our side. And I, I want to explain what I mean by that. I got this insight from Francis Schaeffer. And first he noted that if Christianity is true, then it is an accurate view of reality. And that would mean that all human beings are really made in the image of God, and all human beings must live in the world that God made, even if they don't believe it. All right. Therefore, if Christianity is true and it's the better explanation of reality, atheists who deny God must be living in denial of, of reality at some point. Therefore, sooner or later, atheists who deny God's world, reality, are going to bump into the world as it really is. And what I mean here is they're going to affirm some feature of reality, sometimes without even realizing it, that makes no sense given their worldview, but makes perfect sense given our worldview. How could that be when your worldview in itself makes no recognizable sense? Take Richard Dawkins, for example. He's probably the world's most famous atheist right now. Dawkins says that, on the one hand, if you look at nature, according to him, there is no design, and no purpose, and no evil, and no good. Nothing, he says, but blind, pitiless indifference. Now, that totally consistent with this atheistic worldview. No evil, no good. Belief in morality, on his view, is just a trick evolution plays on us to get our selfish genes into the next generation. So at that point when he says that, he is making statements that are completely consistent with his worldview of atheism. However, on the other hand, in his book, The God Delusion, he attacks the God of the Bible. And here's what he says. He says, the God of the Old Testament is a vindictive, bloodthirsty, homophobic, genital, sadistic, malevolent bully. Now, do you see the problem there? Clearly, Dawkins is not coming to that conclusion based on his atheism, which he says dictates no evil, no good. Notice all of those challenges to God of the Old Testament are that he's evil. That complaint against God makes no sense in his worldview. I don't know if Dawkins believes in objective morality or not. The first quote seems to indicate that he doesn't. However, if he doesn't believe in objective morality, that doesn't preclude him from passing subjective moral judgments. If he made the quoted judgments subjectively, then those two statements are perfectly compatible. But I'll tell you something, moral assessments like that I don't think they're accurate in his case, but that kind of assessment make perfect sense in our world view. I don't agree that objective moral statements make sense in either world view. Even if there is a God who dictates morality, that still would not make morality objective. There would still be no objective, non-circular reason why we ought to follow God's moral instructions. So Dawkins, notice, is living in a contradiction on this issue. All right. Not if his moral judgments are intended to be subjective. He talks on the one hand kind of like an atheist, and then all of a sudden when his guard is down, his natural understanding of morality that God built into him is coming out. If God built morality into Dawkins, then wouldn't this particular moral judgment that God himself is immoral also be built in? If not, why not? If God built morality into people, then how could it be possible for that God-given moral intuition to judge God himself to be immoral? But it's a contradiction with his atheism. And that is a point of tension. And Francis Schaeffer said, when we see that, when we see Dawkins, in this case, bumping into reality, when he raises those kinds of moral complaints against God, and he's trading on our worldview, not his, that's where we can draw attention to it and use that on our behalf. What I'm saying is this, Christianity has better explanatory power. In other words, it fits the world in a way that atheism does not on some very, very important issues.
Again, theism does not explain objective morality because even if there is a God, there is still no objective, non-circular reason why we ought to follow God's moral instructions. What is the objective moral reason we ought to follow God's instructions? Because God instructs us to? You see the problem with that, right? It's clearly circular. Sometimes I hear the argument that God created us, therefore we owe him obedience. Who says that created beings owe their creators obedience? If the reason creations should obey their creators is because those those creators say so, then we run into the same circularity problem. William Lane Craig once said that the reason we should obey God is because there is an axiomatic duty to obey competent authorities. Says who? If that axiom exists independent of God, then there is at least one moral principle that can exist independent of God. And God is therefore not necessary for objective morality per se. If the reason there is a duty to obey competent authorities is because God says so, then we've run into the circularity problem again. And these are issues that resonate with our deepest intuitions about reality, our deepest understandings about the way the world actually is. What are some of those bumps I was talking about? Those features of reality that the atheist bumps into that makes no sense at all in his worldview, but makes perfect sense in our worldview. Okay, now, lots of different examples of that, but in this class, I want to talk to you about three bumps with reality that create serious worldview problems for the atheist, but turn out supporting our worldview perfectly. Okay? I'm just going to call them the bump of stuff, the bump of bad, and the bump of me. So that's going to be my outline for the rest of our course. Let's take a moment and see what we've covered so far in this session. First, we defined our terms. We said that theism is a belief that there is a God, and atheism is the belief that there is no God. It's not simply a lack of belief about God. It's a lack of belief in God, but there certainly is a belief about God that they need to defend. What belief about God do I need to defend? I don't believe in the non-existence of God because I don't understand what God is. Therefore, I don't know what it even means to say that a God does or does not exist. These are the ways that atheists bump into reality. And next time, we're going to talk about the first bump, the bump of stuff. I think you did a bump of stuff before you made this video. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.